Uh, today we are going to have the third part of the tutorial by Ahmed on the methods of stat statistical physics. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I thought I would do one more thing about AMP, which is just to show you um, how can you get that iteration. So perhaps the most mysterious term in the AMP iteration was that memory term. Um, I would like to show how to get that memory term or how to derive that iteration heuristically from just usual message passing from a graph uh, on a graph. And then I'll talk about the perceptron model and I'll use it as a very simple toy model to make some observations about the topics that we care about in this, in this workshop, which are the relationships between over-parameterization, generalization, and efficient algorithms. So let me write down perhaps AMP again. So this was the iteration. Let me just write T here instead of L. And we had a memory term that looked like this. So which involved the previous iteration, like two steps before, right? And BT, so okay, MT was any function that you get to pick of these iterates U. And BT has the following form. IT. That's it. So how do you derive something like this? If you remove this, then this is just some kind of power iteration, modulo not, okay. If you choose the function F correctly, then this is really just power iteration. So how do you get something that looks like this? And I told you as well about state evolution. Let's assume the matrix is just Gaussian. Instead of having that spike, rank one spike, I'm just going to assume that the AIJs are N0, 1 over N. So in this particular case, state evolution tells you that for any test function C, if you look at the ULs, UTs, and look at the empirical distribution of these guys, then this converges to a Gaussian. So a sigma t z, z is Gaussian. So now this, this is a special case of the theorem that I showed you yesterday. So I, uh, and the matrix A had a spike in it, xx transpose plus w, w was Gaussian. And furthermore, I looked at test functions that also included the spike here, x0, right? In which case you get a comma here and then another thing, right? So let's just look at this special case. Right, and then I'll show you perhaps uh, heuristically how this falls from, from, from message passing. So what is message passing? So you're on a graph and you're sending messages in the following form. So you're on a vertex I you want to send a message to vertex, vertex J. So this is I, this is J. You look at the neighbors of I, and you send you sum over all neighbors of I that are not J, and put in the matrix A. So this is K, for instance. A uh, I K. You do the messages that K sends to I. So this is the iteration. So if you want to send a message here, you just look at all the messages that come from the neighbors of I that are not J, then you do something with them and then you send the message, right? In particular, I applied a function FT to each one of them. I could get to choose it however I want. And I just sum over the weights. So the edges here are associated to the weights or the weights are associated to the, to the edges of this graph, the weights being the AIJs, right? Um, and you get to initialize however you'd like. So for instance, I'll initialize at time zero by a UI that doesn't depend on J and let's say it's Gaussian, whatever. Okay, we can start with a Gaussian. So what does UI toward J1? So at step one, what does it look like? 
So this is AI K F T F U K zero. Right? This is a Gaussian, but more importantly, this is independent of this, right? So if you condition on these guys, then this is just, just a sum of Gaussians, which means that this is also a Gaussian. The variance being the second moment of this guy. Okay, conditional on these, right? So now let's move on to step two. So I'll write this again. One. All right, now you have to pay a little bit more attention. So you're looking at the messages. So, you, so the main thing you're going to try to do is to understand the dependence between this randomness and this randomness, right? In order to make a claim about what the distribution of the iterates is, right? And then you can see that these two are independent because u sub k to i, when k sends some message to i, it sums over all the neighbors of i that are not j, right? And those weights, are independent of this. So if you look at, since let me see, perhaps I should write exactly what this message is, right? L minus I. Okay. L zero. So since L, so we compare these two, right? Since L is different from I, these two are independent. These two are not the same, right? So if you condition on this, this is still a Gaussian. Right, and you, keep, you can keep playing this game as long as the graph has a large girth, you can keep playing this game and you can still making the same claims, right? Okay, so you get the idea why the error should be Gaussian, right? So this is yes. Sorry, is this where is it like a central limit theorem argument? Because you assume a really big graph. Uh, no, so there's no central limit theorem. You could do the central limit theorem if you initialize in a different way, but here these are really just like proper Gaussians. Right, and my matrix is Gaussian, so it's just a linear combination of Gaussians. It's still Gaussian, yes. Perhaps I missed something. But this is not going to work. I mean, it worked up to the first mm -hmm. step, but it's not going to work in the next step because now you have dependencies. So if the graph is a tree, okay, graph is a tree, you're fine. Right. So if the graph has large girth, then you're fine. Right. Up to the girth, up to the okay. up to the girth, that's fine. Right. But then you're going to have to start tracking the the the, the, the dependencies. Right. right. But here I'm looking at the opposite of that situation for AMP. The graph is the complete graph. So this argument fails at step three. Exactly. Right? So I'll show you now what happens. Okay, good question. Let me tell you now how to uh, get AMP from, from GP. Right, so if the graph is the complete graph, then you can look at one iterate, so at any point in time, uh, j, then that's the sum over the neighbors i minus j. So you're in the complete graph, so this is just the sum over all k's that are not i and j. Is this correct? Yes. So I can so I have only one term that is that is excluded here. I can try to include it. 
and then subtracts it back minus and I'll subtract the term that corresponds to J. J towards I T, right? So you can see that this term doesn't depend on J, right? It's just a sum that only depends on I. And the only contribution of J is this term, but this term is small, right? This term, because AIJ is a Gaussian with this much variance, this term is of order one over square root n. Right. So we can hope since the graph is complete, it's a, it's a complete graph, you can perhaps try to simplify this iteration instead of saying that I will send an individualized message to every one of its neighbors, you can just try to say the bulk message to everybody, right? So the messages that you can try to hope to send are these, which I'm gonna call just ui t plus one. But let me write it more explicitly. It's really just this. K towards i, right? So I remove the dependency on j. But now I have to see how this thing evolves when you do an iteration of, of BP. Right, so if I write it. So let me write, write k towards i this message in full. So k towards i is the sum over always. So this is j, this is i, this is k, and I have to sum over the neighbors of k. I'm going to call them l. So l that are the neighbors of k that are not i, right? And since you're in the complete graph, this is just uh, what it is. K l k minus one u l two k. Correct. This is what it is. Now I can play the same game here. So I can add and subtract the terms that corresponds to I, but then you're gonna have to be careful. Okay, from one to N, I F T, sum over all L from one to N of this then, right? But that's what? Up. That's u t uh, l not k l not i. This is the message. This is k. Right. Minus the term that corresponds to i here. So i k minus one u i to k minus. One. Okay, so this term is of order one over square root n. So I isolated, you see, I added a term, I added the term and subtracted that same term and that term exactly corresponds to the IK. So whatever you're multiplying by here, it shows up also here. So basically what happens here is that you're, when you're doing message passing, you're not, you're, you're, you're doing a, an iteration that sums over non-backtracking paths. You don't want to backtrack back to where you were. So the only dependency in this term between these two is through exactly that same weight, which is k, k i, right? Now I can just do a first order Taylor expansion of f around this. So this is small, this is of order one, presumably. T F U K T, and then I have minus sum over K from one to N. Then I have A K I A I K, which is the same. So this guy gets squared. 
I have f t minus one a few i to k this term. Right. And then I multiply by f t of this, f prime, excuse me, f prime t. Now, I have a dependence on k here. I would like to get rid of it, right? Then I can try to play the same game again. Just add and subtract the term that makes this uh, k go away, right? But then I have an error of 1 over square root n here. Okay. Now, the claim is that this doesn't matter. You can try to do it. And you'll see if you do it, the term that's going to multiply these KIs are going, is, are going to be independent. So this thing is going to be independent of this. Therefore, it's going to go away because it has expectation zero. It has variance one over n to the power three halves. This is square, and this is one over square root n. It's going to be n to the power three halves, right? So that doesn't matter. So I get I get to stop at this at this stage. So here I'm allowed to remove the k from here and add one over square root n. Okay, so if I do that, then this doesn't depend on k anymore. The only sum, the only thing that k hits or this sum hits is this thing and this thing, right? And this come out, comes out, but this is exactly bt, right? That term that appears in message passing, right? Yeah, ft has to be regular. If it's ft is not regular, we would have to regular regularize it. And yeah, yeah, it has to be Lipschitz. So. Right. So at the end, so what do I get as an iteration? I get ui t plus one equals okay. ft okay. minus over k squared prime f t minus one f u t minus one k right so this is not exactly b t but this thing concentrates around one over n because it has variance one over n the sum will concentrate around around one over n this thing will concentrate around the expectation of this thing. So I can just replace this. And here, there is a one over n here because it comes from this one. All right, so this is bt. And then you have ft minus one, if you k t minus one. All right, so this is exactly the AMP iteration. So if you call these guys mt, so this is mt minus one, then you get u t plus one. So in vector form, so this is just for every coordinates on its own. In vector form, this is what it is. Right. So that's how you get AMP. So AMP comes just by tracking the dependence between when you write down the message passing iteration, just track what's going to have an effect and what's not going to have an effect. And it turns out that the only thing that have an effect are backtracking loops. If you have, so you're sending a message from, let's say, a, a, I to J, and you're not allowed to backtrack in message passing. But then if you try to allow yourself to backtrack, you're going to have to track the dependence. What, what kind of error does this backtracking introduce to your algorithm? And it turns out that the only effect of this is to introduce this memory term. Right, so graphically you can see it like this. You're not allowed to backtrack in message passing, but if I want to backtrack in the complete graph, then the only effect of that backtracking is to introduce this memory term. Right, that's it. So perhaps not your question about that the argument doesn't extend. It works up to distance two, right? But then the claim is that in a dense graph, distance three and above is subdominant, it goes away. Because of this thing that I said here is that, so the, here I had a K, 
But then if I try to remove this k and add a one over square root n here, then this one over square root n hits a one over n. It gets me n to the one, to, to the power of three halves, which is subdominant compared to the main quantities here. So for a, for, a, for a complete graph, the only thing that matters is just a two-step thing. So just backtracking like this. Okay, so for graph, we're fine because there are no uh, short uh, cycles. Correct. For a dense graph, we're fine because the, the, the local stuff just gets washed away by the... Yeah. Correct. So what's the bad situation? So the bad situation would be a complete graph where the weights are not small. So here my weights are mean zero, variance one over n. So if you have a complete graph, but the weights are not small, if the weights were one, then this doesn't, doesn't work, right? So really what makes it work is that, so you're, you're making the, the graph denser. Suppose you have a sparse graph. Now try to make it denser, but then you're lowering the weights of every edge so that you're still in the same regime more or less, right? So you're going to have to have weights that are small if you have the graph, that dense graph, so that you can wash away the long, long range dependency. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So this is how you get the algorithm. And you see, OK, so this is an exercise. It's nice. And OK, I think there is a proof of this uh, you know, a rigorous version of this by Olea and, uh, and uh, Javan Mart, uh, Adel Javan Mart. But, um, Perhaps one thing to take away from this is that uh, algorithmically, if you're interested in the algorithm here, you have to track n squared messages, right? I to J, and you're simplifying it to track only n messages. So you're reducing the complexity of your algorithm by the quadratic factor, right? n squared versus n, and you're still having the same behavior. So state evolution, you can see state, state evolution as a reminiscent fact from the message passing iteration that it's always Gaussian because you're not allowed to backtrack, it's always Gaussian, but this pres preserves that structure as long as you're adding this uh, memory term. Okay, so that perhaps that's all I have to say about this. Okay. So if you look at the physics papers or the physics papers that try to study machine learning problems, they do a lot of this, these things. So I wanted to show you this because this is what happens in a lot of those arguments. Okay, good. So now let me switch gears. I want to talk about the perceptron problem. So perhaps I'll present the perceptron problem in a way that is slightly unfamiliar, but this is the version that the probabilists like. So I have a bunch of Gaussian vectors in n dimension, and I have m of them. All right, so they're IID. And I'm trying to look, search for a vector. Okay, I have another parameter, kappa. And I'm trying to search for find, find a theta that is either in plus minus one. You can choose it to be either binary or on the sphere, if you'd like, of the same radius such that. All of these linear inequalities are satisfied. Okay. So you have a bunch of data points, and you're trying to look for a hyperplane that has a margin at least kappa when multiplied when when you test all of those points against that linear function, right? And this is perhaps related to the maybe you can see it as a separator, okay, linear separator. And if you care about learning, this is a very simplistic model. So you have data and you're looking for a function f, which is uh, perhaps just a sign x minus kappa. And you would like to find, so this is related, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's related. So if 
find data such that equals y i for all i, right? So it's a similar problem. Turns out that this problem, okay, so the questions that you could ask when you have such a problem, depending on whether, okay, so either I fixed binary or a sphere, I can ask for fixed M and N. So M is the number of constraints, N is the dimension. Does this problem have a solution or not? So for what values, for what comparative values of M and N does this problem has a solution as a function of kappa? Then when there exist solutions, can I find them efficiently? And now when they exist solutions, what do they look like? What does the space of solutions look like? So these are the kind of questions that we ask, right? Turns out, okay, so there is a long history of this in stat phys. The, there's a conjecture about what is the satisfiability threshold of this. There is a bound that was derived by Sun and Ding, um, but it's still an open problem to derive the other bounds. Um, but a much easier problem to study. So remark that I can make the inequalities go the other way without, without loss of generality because this is a Gaussian, right? Symmetric. Now, the problem that is a lot easier to study is a, if I put absolute values here. So this is called the symmetric perceptron. And I'm just gonna, let me just focus on the binary case. So the symmetric binary perceptron. Is that so data binary such that for all i kappa square root n? So I'm putting a square root n here because this is a vector of size square root n. If I divided this, is just a univariate Gaussian, right? But it's a, okay, this whole thing is a univariate Gaussian of mean zero variance one. So you can ask questions about when is this satisfiable? When can you find the solutions of this form? So if you, I ask you that, you can try to find one and find a sufficient condition for an algorithm to work, but let's not do that yet because that's a hard question. An easier thing is to just count the number of solutions, right, in expectation. And if that expectation is negative, that means, or not negative, if it goes to zero, that means that there are no solutions. And this is called the moment method. So let me introduce the moment method. This is a combinatorial argument. So this is akin to the probabilistic technique. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The why would, why do you want to study this problem? There are many reasons. So people study this because of neural nets, really. How is this related to neural nets? Well, you can just look at it as a linear. Well, not, not when you do, when you put the absolute value. No, no, oh, the, the, the absolute value, this is for math. This is because I'm a mathematician. This is just really purely because of math, because we can prove things in this setting and we cannot prove the things when there is no, when there are no absolute values. The conjecture of the, the, the physicists believe is that the landscape doesn't change. It's the same properties. The problem is easier mathematically, but the phenomenology is still the same. And I'll show you what happens in the phenomenology. I'll show you, I'll talk about what's going on. You're, you don't seem, you don't seem happy. Completely different problem, right? I mean, because you, when you did that, we're generally interested, okay, so this is, um, yeah. this is the, the problem so with negative, we're generally interested with theta xi being uh, positive. And this really only make, when you, when you did the sign change, you really are now looking at kind of the negative perception. You're looking at a negative margin, right? There's no longer, I mean, we're really interested in separability. Yeah. And in order for this to make sense, before you flipped, you have to talk about non separability yeah. And then, so why would we think that it has anything to do with the- No, it doesn't. Uh, that's, okay. that, that's the motivation. That's like the, the, the motivation. Your motivation is to study problems where there's no absolute value. And I'm saying that if I change the problem like this, then I can prove things about it. And I believe that's the okay. same, same thing was still true. Okay, so that last statement is what I, I mean, is there any reason to think that- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is because of the, the if you try to do the cavity method and those things, then the, they, they give the qualitatively the same, the same results. So the math is a much harder, but the phenomenology is still the same. This is like, this is what probability theory is about. So like you look for simple models that preserve the same structure and there's universality. Like 
why would this problem be much, much different than the one where there is no absolute value, right? The, like the same things happen, like, but this is like perhaps a different approach than what like, is typically taken in other fields. But yeah, like, you try to develop methods to study these things and then you start with the easiest case and I like, find the best easiest case. Yeah. Uh, sorry, why, why is the time between you two less than? Say, say that again. <laughs> Uh, why the inequality can be changed to less than the? Oh, if I don't, if I remove the absolute values, then I can change the sign. I mean, modulo change in kappa by minus kappa, but x is symmetric, right? X and minus x have the same distribution. So, so I think that maybe what I mean, because I know it confused me for a long time, because it's, you can change it, but then you have to be fine with having a negative margin. Like if you don't think there's a difference in having a, in actually having a margin. And having a negative margin, which means that things are, are not actually severable, yeah. then it's fine. I mean, that's because that, that K is actually is the negative. So, right. Negative so, margin. let's do this again. So, I started like this, right? Now, if you put minus signs, then you do this, right? But then the minus signs goes here. And this is also an X prime I, which has the same distribution, right? But then you change the margin as much as said, from positive to negative, or from negative to positive. Makes sense. <laughs> right, this is really just a, you know, just put the equality, multiply by minus and put the equalities. It's really that's what it is. It's nothing, nothing, nothing complicated. So now the kappa is the negative, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't tell you that kappa is positive to begin oh. with. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what kappa positive or negative. Is this fine? <laughs> So, is, is the problem without the absolute values also like is a solution? Or, or solution with the solution in, in the sense the things that you're going to show us, can you also do it without the absolute value, but it's harder or is it not? Yeah, well, you can try to do certain things, limited things. I can let, let me let me just continue. I'll talk about the parallels. I'll talk about the parallels. So we can ask what is the what, when are there solutions to this problem? Okay, so the first thing you can try to do is just count the number of solutions. Right? So that's this thing happens. Oh, hi. Now if I take the expectation of this. This is an easy problem. Uh, the sum of thetas, expectation of this is just the probability of this. Then these are independent constraints. Okay, the xi's are independent, so you get the probability that theta xi is smaller than kappa squared n to the power m, right? Or just x1, right? Because these are independent. Constraints are independent. But what is this? This is a univariate Gaussian. Model. And multiply by when you divide by square root n, this is a univariate Gaussian, right? This is just a univariate Gaussian. So let me take kappa p of kappa to be that probability that the univariate Gaussian is smaller than kappa. This is just a number, right? So this is two to the power n. This thing doesn't depend on theta. This times p of kappa to the power n. It's a really simple computation. Right? So if the expectation goes to zero, that means that there are no solutions with high probability. When does the expectation go to zero? So this will go to zero. If so this is this is larger than one, this is two, this is smaller than one. So it's a competition competition between these two terms. And this will go to zero if m is larger than minus log two over log p of kappa. So this is the first moment bound, right? So no solutions with high probability if this is true, times n, times n. Right, so I'm gonna call this number of kappa. So no solutions with high probability if 
alpha, let me call alpha the ratio between M and N, and alpha is uh, larger than alpha set. Right. There are too many constraints to satisfy all of them. Right. It turns out, so one reason you put the absolute value is that it turns out that this very simple bound is tight. Right? It is tight. If I didn't put the absolute values, then this bound would be wrong. Okay, so this is one reason. It's a lot easier to study the symmetric problem than to study the non-symmetric problem. So how do you prove that this is the right bound? Um, this is, you have to do the second moment. So for instance, if I want to prove that Z is positive, greater than one, this is an integer. So if I want to prove that this thing goes to one, for instance, then I can use what's called the pili sigmund inequality. It turns out that this is larger than the ratio of the second moment, the first moment squared over the second moment. This is just by cauchy schwarz This is called the pili sigmund inequality. Right. So therefore, if the second moment is bounded by a constant times the first moment squared, if I can prove something like this, then the probability that Z is positive is greater than one over C, which is positive. So I can prove, I can't prove it with high probabilities using this method, I can prove it with positive probability, right? So the only thing that remains to show is that the second moment is bounded by a constant times the first moment squared. Right. So then you can ask about the question, now can I boost this to high probability statement, right? Instead of having positive probability of solution existing, solutions existing, can I boost that to a statement about high probability? This method will not give you that. You're going to have to work a lot harder. But this is, uh, this is so this is uh, maybe just one on one constraint satisfaction problems, right? This is, this is what the perhaps the first class on constraint satisfaction will teach you, random constraints. Yeah. So we try to compute the second moment. What time is it? I'm not going to compute the second moment. Okay, let me not do the second moment. But it's a computation that is very nice. And you can do it really, it's not hard. And basically what you get is that you get the second moment is n. If you do that Laplace method, you get that this is n times the maximum of a certain function with a parameter q. And the parameter q, I keep writing the same q here. And this is the same q that appeared in the replica symmetric formula. This is the same q that appeared in AMP and state evolution. Is just the overlap between two replicas. When you take two independent copies from the solution space, look at their overlap. What is the most likely overlap? Right. And this function will look like this. So this says zero minus one, one. It's symmetric. Okay, I'm not going to be able to draw a symmetric function, but bear with me. Like this. So you're understand you're trying to understand the maximum. The maximum is either here or plus or close to plus or minus one. Turns out that by the magic of the absolute value again, if alpha is smaller than alpha sat, alpha is smaller than alpha sat, and this is not hard to prove again, then the maximum of that function maximum is achieved at zero. Minus one, one is achieved at zero, which means that most likely if you take two solutions at random, when you take their overlap, take their inner product, the, the inner product is zero. So most solutions are orthogonal to each other, right? So the maximum is here. So this is this value is lower. This value is lower. And it turns out when you compute p of zero, right? And therefore, the second moment is exponential n times p of zero. It turns out that this is exactly the expectation of z squared. It's just this thing squared. 
4 to the power n p of kappa to the power 2 m. Okay, so this is one thing that the second moment tells you. Okay, so therefore solutions exist if alpha smaller than alpha set uh, with positive probability. If alpha smaller than alpha set. Okay, so we identified the satisfiability threshold, which is this. So now take alpha smaller than that, and then ask whether you can find solutions or not. An earlier question that I can ask is what does the space of solutions look like, right? It turns out that all solutions are isolated. Most solutions are isolated. And that comes perhaps heuristically from this picture. If you take two copies at random, two solutions at random independently, you look at their overlap, the statement that the maximum is achieved at zero tells you that the overlap between two solutions is gonna be zero, right? They're gonna be orthogonal. And then you can extrapolate that to say perhaps, yeah, one of you, go ahead. Uh, do you need alpha greater than alpha? Alpha greater than alpha sat means there are more constraints. There cannot exist more solutions in that situation. So alpha smaller than alpha sat. So no solutions if alpha is greater than alpha sat. Ah, I see. Solutions in the opposite right here. And uh, given that the second moment is exactly the first moment squared. A constant, no, really. It's just, there's a constant. I see. Very constant. No, otherwise if you have the exact concentration. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I'm a little kind of confused. Like, why would the why would the um, like expected overlap of any two solutions have anything to do with the solutions existing in the first place? Like, to me, that describes what you're talking about now, which is like, how does the solution space look like? Yeah, but like, aren't we assuming that solutions exist when we're looking at the No, yeah, no, no. So here, this is just uh, maybe just the way I understand it. So it's just a heuristic thing to say. So you're looking, you're Suppose you're below satisfiability, so you you have solutions, and then you take two of them, you look at their overlap and look at what is the most likely value for that inner product, right? I claim that that's given by the maximum of this function. I did not prove that, but that's what I claim. Yeah. But the thing that is related to proving whether there exist solutions or not is computing the actual second moment. That's that's a fine thing to do, right? So now it turns out that the space of solutions really is a bunch of singletons. Theorem is for all alpha smaller than alpha sat. So this is by Abe, Lee, and Sly, and also Perkins and Soup 2021, I think. So this was conjectured in physics. This has been known conjecturally for a while. But then the proof came a bit later. For all alpha, for all densities, whenever the problem is satisfiable, whenever there are solutions, most solutions. So a solution, perhaps a more rigorous way to say it, a solution picked uniformly at random. At random is isolated with high probability. Isolated and isolated really means that there is a linear Hamming distance between solutions. The closest solution to this one is a linear distance linear in N away from it. Okay, so if most solutions are like this, how can you possibly find a solution? It seems like an impossible task. This is a problem that is you have extreme clustering, right? Now, if you think of an algorithm that just does you know, local moves, then there is no way you can jump from one to another. So how can you find solutions at all, right? So this is a puzzling thing. Yet there are algorithms that find solutions. So it's been known that certain heuristics work. And you can look at this problem from the point of view of discrepancy theory. And there are many, many algorithms from discrepancy that will solve this problem for you. You're gonna have to work hard to prove that they work, but they work. So yet algorithms exist, but they exist at very small alpha. Exist 
that small alpha. Turns out that it cannot exist in large alpha. There is a proof. It cannot exist in large alpha. Right? So the solution space is completely clustered, and then yet solutions exist. So here's an so this is a conundrum. Why is that the case? Turns out that this is an empirical observation. Also, all algorithms that work, the heuristic that works, will find solutions that are connected to many other solutions. So whenever a heuristic succeeds empirically, it turns out that it finds a solution that is connected to many other solutions. But I just told you that most solutions are isolated. So efficient algorithm must go into an exponentially rare region in the solution space that finds solutions that are connected to each other. Right? So how does how does that happen? Why is that the case? Right? So this is a problem that we don't know how to under, we don't understand yet. And you can show that certain you, you can show that such structures actually exist, not just heuristically, not just because of empirical observations. There is a theorem by these same people that shows that there exists this thing that is called the wide, wide web. So another theorem is there exists a connected component, connected component of maximal diameter of, okay, diameter to n. With high probability when alpha is small enough. So if you pick a solution at random, you'll never find it here. If you just pick a solution at random from the entire space, you're not going to land in a connected component, but they exist, right? But the crazy thing is that efficient algorithms will land you there, right? So efficient algorithms do not sample uniformly, they will get you there. So this is, yeah, this is, this is uh, something that we don't understand. Can you say what isolated is? Isolated, if you pick a solution at random, what is, then, then start growing a radius and then stop when you find another solution in that radius, right? And that radius that you have to go with is linear in N. I mean, distance, yeah, just flipping coordinates, right? So this is something that is that is very similar to generalization, to, to, to the, the, the question of over-parameterization over and uh, the efficient algorithms that work under over-parameterization. So over-parameterization here means that the number of constraints is much smaller, number of data points that you get, the x size is much smaller than the dimension, which means that alpha is small, right? So algorithms exist and we don't understand why. So the question here, perhaps from the point of view of this theory is what is the structural property of the solution space that makes this thing happen? So what property is responsible for this behavior? You don't, you don't care about that. That's what you get. You don't care about that. You just want to find a solution. But then when you do your algorithm, if it works, it'll get you a cluster. So perhaps the, another claim is that uh, this is not proven, but it's believed that you cannot find these solutions. If they're isolated, you cannot find them. The only solutions you can find are the good ones, which are in a dense cluster. Wait, have you said what the algorithms that find these solutions are? I did not. Um, there are a few. Um, there is one, for instance, by Kim and Roche, which does this majority, multi-scale majority algorithm. So this is your matrix of the data. So the X's are like this. And the theta is here. And you want this to be, let's say, smaller than kappa, right? What you do is you partition your matrix into blocks. The first one you just initialize however you'd like. Then you choose these guys in a way that will push you below. And also that doesn't change too much. That only adds noise to the rest of the coordinates, basically. So you want to, you, this is a, you have inequalities here. You have one, two, three, up to M inequalities, right? You choose one, you try to push this one below kappa, but then you don't want to hurt yourself in the other ones. 
right? And there is a way to do this. There is it's called multi-scale majority. It's a very nice algorithm. It works. Yeah. So there's an algorithm that looks like this. There's another algorithm from discrepancy theory that is based on, I don't really remember um, what is it based on. Some kind of potential. You try to minimize some kind of potential when you try to move inside the cube. And then you would like to get to the corners of the cube so that you have to round at some point to get to the corners of the cube. There's something like this. I don't remember exactly. So the physicists tried to look at this following construction. So they say what they say is, here's a proposal. You can look at the what's called the local entropy. What time is it? When am I done? Yes. Local entropy. So the local entropy, what is that? So you look at a reference solution, and then you look at solutions that are around it at distance r or n times r, and count them. You count them, and then you plot that function. So one particular way, to, so how do you choose this particular reference solution? So that's another thing. So here's one proposal that you can, is mathematically makes sense. So I'm gonna let, so let the space of solutions be S X, this is the, the data, and then kappa is the margin. I'm gonna let a solution theta zero be in here, kappa prime prime. And I'm gonna let kappa prime be a slightly smaller margin than kappa. So the solution, so pick it uniformly at random, then you're gonna land somewhere that is isolated. So the solution will be isolated. But then the point is here. So the observation is that as you start increasing kappa, more solutions will show up around it. So what you have is a zero xi smaller than kappa square root n, kappa prime square root n. When you start increasing kappa prime, then this is still a solution, right? So it's not a problem. But the point is more solutions are going to start showing up when you increase kappa. There weren't solutions before. And one claim is that more solutions are going to start to show up around this one. So this one becomes no longer isolated. Right. It's no longer isolated, but that's fine because it's not typical anymore in this new ensemble. When you increase kappa, that solution is not typical anymore. It's not drawn from the uniform measure of the new solution set, right? So this is the claim. And now you can count how many of these are. Right, so my function r will be just count the number of y's that are in the solution set for kappa larger than kappa prime, and such that they have a distance, Hamming distance, from the original solution that is n times r. Okay, I'm going to take the logarithm of this. That gives me an entropy. And then I'm going to average over theta zero. Kappa prime average over the size of s, kappa prime, and take an expectation over x. All right, so this is a deterministic function. So this is what it, the local entropy looks like. This is one possible definition of the local entropy. So the crazy thing that is conjectured is the following. So this is, there are no theorems here. This is really like, this is just speculations. So if you draw this function as a function of R, then either it looks like this, it looks like this. This is picture, by the way, I need to credit this to Bandas. Many co-authors, it's Akina. Uh, and others. I don't. I can, can't remember all of them, but this is perhaps from 2020. So what they say is, if the function looks like this, so for, of course that. So the, the this function depends on kappa, kappa prime, and alpha. Now fix kappa prime and alpha, and uh, kappa prime and kappa, and change alpha. It turns out that the behavior is that when you increase alpha. This is what happens. So for alpha very, very small, the function is strictly increasing. If you keep increasing alpha at some point, it's gonna gain a local maximum. If you keep increasing alpha, it's gonna be negative. 
And the, 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 what they say is that this is the algorithmically easy regime. This is hard. And if it's negative, there's no solutions. But, okay, both of these are hard, let's say. There are solutions, but not close to, close to the, the, the reference solution. This is hard, this is hard, let's say. So this is a property, whatever this property is, okay, so they, they gave a particular property of the solution space, but this is independent of algorithms, right? That doesn't have to do anything with the algorithms. It's just a property of the space that tells you whether the problem is easy or hard, right? This is perhaps in contrast to what uh, Nadi said in, in his talk that the, that it depends on the algorithm that not just the generalization, but the, the faculty of finding a solution will depend on the algorithm is algorithm specific. And if you change the algorithm, you get a new effective regularization. Here I'm looking at interpolator. So everything gets to minimum, minimum zero error. So here I'm in the satisfiable regime, right? And this is a property that does not depend on the algorithm. So if this happens, then the problem will be easy. If this doesn't happen, the problem will be hard. This is all conjectural, of course. We don't know how to prove these things yet. Okay. So perhaps let me now try to generalize this picture and just ask questions. I have nothing to prove. I, I'm not, I don't have any new results to prove here, but perhaps the questions are the most interesting. So now if you look at ERM, yeah. So even if it has a maximal and closed down, why, why is that like hard? Like, right, so the way to think about it, there are a few ways to think about it. One way to think about it is that an algorithm somehow will start here and it's going to try to increase to, to maximize this, go along the steepest slope of this entropy function. It's like when you look at the RS formula, then AMP will try to get to the nearest global maxima from whatever you're starting. Turns out if you escape, that means that the problem is easy. I don't, okay. So if you want to, if you, if you want a more convincing heuristic, I need to tell you about full RSP. I don't want to talk about full replicate symmetry right now. Um, but um, this is the picture that they, this is empirical. This is really just empirical. So if you look at ERM, so you have data. That's some distribution, and you'd like to minimize. This. Over theta. So you have a function class that is parameterized by theta, you would like to minimize this. And if the function class is large enough, then you have interpolators, you can get to zero error. So suppose that the function, the loss function, this is positive, but then when you take for any y and you take the minimum over x, this is zero. So you can drive this to zero for all y, for y in plus minus one, right? So then if the function class is large enough, you can get interpolators, which is the set, I'm gonna call it S, of all the thetas such that L of F theta xi yi is zero. Right? For all i. And one specific example of this is this story that I told you. If you pick f, the function class, and the loss function adequately, you get really the perceptron, right? So, for instance, if l of xy. this function and f theta of x is just theta uh, sine perhaps sine no, no sine that's it right so in which case in which case you get that this set s is um, a set of theta such that you want to drive this to zero. So the inequality will flip when this is zero. Y i smaller than square root n. 
for all i. Okay, so now you can recall, you can call x i y i another x i, right? And that gives you the perceptron problem. Right? So this is a special case of the, the ERM framework if you care about interpolation. So what is overparameterization here means? So M is the number of samples that you get, the number of the size of the data set. And N, I didn't say N, okay, N is the dimension of the data, right? So N has to be much larger than M. That's the overparameterized regime, right? Yeah. Um, in that case, you land in the same regime that we were looking at. So M much larger than N, or much smaller than N. So that means that alpha is small, right? So alpha is M over N. So the overparameterization just means that the number of constraints is much smaller than number than the dimension. And that's the behavior that I showed you happens for the perceptron. When you're in this overparameterized regime, most solutions are bad. The ones that you find efficiently are somewhat good, like they're connected to other solutions. So how does that happen? Okay. So that's one question. And we can generalize this now. If you once you understand this connection, you can then try to generalize this. So perhaps I'll just end with a few questions that I'm interested in. So the first one is: Can you find a model of neural networks? And we find a model neural networks, perhaps let's just say maybe just two linear, two, two layer, such that if we pick a parameter theta at random from the set of interpolators, right? So this, these are the weights of your own neural net, theta is the weights of your own neural nets, then the generalization error is maximal, whatever maximal means, right? So R of data is the generalization error. Right. Can you do this? Okay, is this, is, this, is this true? If you pick it uniformly at random, then the generalization error is maximal. And the analogy is that when you pick a uniformly at random point from the perceptron problem, and you get an isolated solution. Okay, isolated doesn't mean generalization is bad. I don't know what that means, but okay. So perhaps this is something that we can think about, right? So the second question is about the exceptional set. Okay, bad here, maximal with high probability. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the case of like, what's the answer to this question? Linear models, this is linear. Yes. So is the generalization error maximal? Yeah, so you're going to have to define what generalization error means in the case of the perceptron. And I'm considering data that is Gaussian and that is independent of the y. So for really, so x, i, and y. So this is random noise. The, 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 the labels are just random, they're not related to the x's. In which case, the generalization error is always going to be maximal because there is no correlation between x and y, right? And that's just a one line proof. There is no, so the, 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 this question is trivial in this case. So if you want to ask this question in a more meaningful way, you're going to have to assume a generative model that ties x and y, for instance, by a logistic regression. Yeah. The answer Say that again. Is the answer known if you assume this kind of generative model? Not to this degree of granularity. So uh, I think there is a paper by Andrea, and I think one of his postdocs that studies the uh, perceptron problem on the sphere. That's when data is generated from a model, an actual, like legit model. It proves certain things about algorithms. When can you find a solution, and is it correlated to the quantitative? And but this question, there's fine grain questions about isolation of solutions, but it's not studied. Uh, the second question is about the exceptional sets. Is it does there exist a subset? Of 
inside the set of interpolators that I'm going to call A that has very small volume. Right. So the volume is much smaller comparatively to S, such that the generalization error of theta is very small for all theta in A. Right, so there's an exceptional set that generalizes exceptionally good. So you can think about this set as those dense clusters that show up in the perceptron problem. And the third question, does gradient descend land in A? Okay. So in which case, th this is a property of the problem. This is not a property of the algorithm, right? The existence of this set A is a property of the problem. Right. Now you would assume perhaps like for the perceptron problem that as you increase, so here we're in the over-parameterized regime, we're in the, the regime where, where alpha is very small, but you would expect that as you increase alpha, then this set will no longer exist, right? So, okay, does there exist this set? When does it exist? When does it exist? Doesn't it not exist as a function of alpha? And can you determine that? Right. And the fact whether the set exists or not, does, is that due to a property, another more deeper property, property of the problem that you can try to study? So, okay, so this is, uh, th these are a few questions that you can ask about, uh, about such problems and they're somewhat, they, they seem a lot more, I mean, they're very hard, I think, but the draw or maybe their appeal is that they don't involve studying the problem on an algorithmic specific basis. like. Don't you have you don't have to pick an algorithm and then study the problem as a function of that algorithm, right? It separates studying the problem versus the algorithm, which is what we're used to do in classical statistical theory. Right? Okay, perhaps I'll stop here. I, I don't have anything more to say. Thank you. Telling us about training multi models, but let's thank Amit once again.